This video includes the story of the time I took a literary pilgrimage to the Roman town that inspired the setting of the rats in the walls. It was a terrible idea and I almost died from it. Stay tuned until the end to hear all about it. Just how scary is the rats in the walls? It's scary enough that when I first read it at the age of 15, which is young but not too young, it traumatized me and terrified me so much that I had to swear off Lovecraft for a couple of years. At the time I had already experienced some others of his stories and Dagon in particular had left me reeling, both with the impact of its content and because of how it showed me what fantastical literature could be and, and could do. But the Rats in the Walls was just too much. After I finished it, I didn't sleep for about a week, and I just had to set my collection aside for about two years. I mustn't have been the only person to be so shocked by the story, which originally struggled to meet a publisher. Uh, Lovecraft submitted it to the Argosy All Story Weekly, which rejected it for being, in, in Lovecraft's own sour words, too horrible for the tender sensibilities of a delicately nurtured public. Notice the CK at the end, the, the true mark of a petty bore. The story was later picked up by the much less picky Weird Tales, which published it in March 1924, about five months after Lovecraft originally finished it. Rats in the Walls, like all of Lovecraft, is of course available for free online, so if you haven't read the story, please go and do it. Sweet dreams, by the way. It will only take you one or two hours. What, what follows is obviously full of spoilers. The story follows an unnamed narrator, the last surviving member at the time of writing of the Delapore family, which moved to America from England at the time of James I in the 16th century. The Delapore family history is shrouded in an appropriately spooky aura of doom, horror, general unspeakableness, with hints to terrible secrets buried deep in the family history. Flash forward to 1917, when the US joins World War I, and the narrator's son, Alfred Delapore, is shipped to England as an aviation officer. While in England, Alfred has a fortuitous encounter with a certain Captain Norris, the current owner of the Delapore estate, on which the family's ancient house, Exxon Priory, used to stand. Knowledge of this site reignites in the Delapore family the wish to retrace their roots, although their plans are put on hold by tragic development. One of the things that I find most fascinating about rats is the disconnect early in the story between the narrator's tone and his emotional investment in the events he is narrating. When he talks about his son's return home from World War I and from the battlefields of Europe as an invalid and what we can only assume to be a slow and, and excruciating death, it doesn't spend more than two and a half sentences on this, even though at the time this must have been the source of immense suffering and pain and mourning. All he says is, I bought Exxon Priory in 1918, but was almost immediately distracted from my plans of restoration by the return of my son as a maimed invalid. During the two years that he lived, I thought of nothing but his care, having even placed my business under the direction of partners. In 1921, as I found myself bereaved and aimless, a retired manufacturer no longer young, I resolved to divert my remaining years with my new possession. It's almost as if he doesn't want to talk about the events, and he'd much rather go back to talking about the house, this diversion that he bought, and that became almost an escape from the trauma of losing his son. It's debatable how well this is achieved, but I do believe that the text here is striving toward that same type of dry and detached reporting that Ernest Hemingway was using at the same time in his short stories. Rats in the Walls was written in 1923. And uh, that he, that Hemingway, would employ in a somewhat different, much more stripped-down version that would change the face of American writing, arguably world writing. 
forever. I'm firmly convinced that the text theory is striving toward this type of emotionally detached narration because elsewhere in his stories Lovecraft doesn't refrain at all from describing male friendships and relationships with quite a lot of pathos. The relationship between the narrator and his uncle in the shunned house would probably be the most explicit example of this, but the kind of morbid romanticism that unites the narrator of the tomb with his uh, ancestors and his family would be another example, as would be, of course, the case of Charles Dexter Ward. The Color Out of Space, The Thing on the Doorstep, offers similar examples of very strong, very intense male friendships. Lovecraft himself, when he was growing up, enjoyed a very strong bond with his maternal grandfather, who doted on him to no end and spoiled him to no end. And the death of his grandfather, when he was still very young, marked the beginning of a difficult period for Lovecraft, both of, on an emotional level and on an economical level. His family wasn't nearly as well off after the death of the old man. Throughout his adult life, Lovecraft would also establish a variety of very strong friendships with other writers, other uh, amateur journalists, other uh, people of intellect, always men, and he would always create these strange dynamics where he would assume the role of a grandfatherly figure or some kind of avuncular wise old man would look down on these younger um, intellectuals from a position of amused wisdom. His relationships with the women in his life were, to put it bluntly, not quite as straightforward and blissful, but that's a subject for another video. I should probably say, even as I refer to these details from Lovecraft's life, that I'm not necessarily comfortable with using an author's biography as a key to explain away the meaning of their works. Shouldn't novels and stories stand or fall on their own merits? Aren't they all interrelated but also self-conclusive chapters in that ongoing conversation which is literature? At the same time, I do believe that sometimes in reading a text through the specific lens of the author's biography and, and personal experiences might help us see the, the story or the novel under a different light and help us access certain interpretations that we wouldn't otherwise reach in the same way as reading that same text through a specific uh, critical perspective through a feminist reading or through the lens of queer studies might similarly yield new and stimulating interpretations. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I don't see anything wrong with readings that refer to an author's biography to try and show new and possible meanings embedded within a given text. What I tend to dislike are those very scholastic ways of reading uh, novels or stories or poems where the author's biography is used to explain the text away. Uh, this is something that happens a lot in high school literature classes where you're told that the curtains are blue in the poem because the poet was sad and literature is just turned to glorified journaling. An example of an excellent way of using an author's biography critically and creatively would be Joyce Carol Oates' short story Night Gones, from the collection of the same name. The story narrates the childhood and the inner life of a fictionalized H.P. Lovecraft and clearly draws from Lovecraft's own life and experiences to provide a portrait of the writer as a man with a deeply turbulent but also at times luminous emotional life. A portrait that I find very convincing and that differs a lot from the usual view of Lovecraft as a hateful, emotionally stunted recluse. Sorry for the aside. Moving on with the story, after the death of Alfred, his son, the narrator moves to England, meets with Captain Norris, who is described as plump, which I find hilarious and messed up, and sets about renovating Exxon Priory and bringing it back to its ancient glory. It's when the Priory is back and the narrator can finally move back into it that the really spooky troubles begin. At night, the narrator is woken up by this scuttling noise that he can hear inside the walls of his new house and that sets his cat on edge. <sighs> the cat. Now, the cat has a horrible, disgusting name. He is named after the N-word, which I assume to be a joke considering it's a black cat. Har har, 
all my sites. It's a horrible name and, and there's no way around it. But I do believe firmly that the cat's name has a rather ironic significance within the context of the story, in ways that I'm sure were completely lost on Lovecraft himself, let alone his narrator. H.P. Lovecraft famously said that the world is indeed comic, but the joke is on mankind. And I believe this is true in ways that Lovecraft himself, with his petty racism, probably didn't consider. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to rename the narrator's cat Fluffo because I can't really keep referring to it to him as the cat that's named after the n-word. Now, this is the part where I'm going to implore you that if you haven't read the story, you absolutely stop. Why would you even be watching the video? Because I'm going to spoil the story's denouement, which is one of the most shocking twists I've yet encountered in my literary explorations. By all means, don't continue if you haven't read the story. For those of you who have, as a reminder, all the cats in the house start acting up at night, the scuttling in the walls and the cats chasing it seem to be all heading toward a certain subcellar of Roman origins, the narrator and Captain Norris stay up one night in the cellar to investigate, bad dreams, Fluffo directs the man to an altar in the subcellar, which clearly bars the way to some secret passage descending into further underground depths, a group of experts, explorers, scholars is assembled, and the party, including Captain Norris and the narrator, pushes the altar aside and... There are countless ways to interpret just what happens in the final pages of the story. The events themselves are appropriately blurry and even contradictory, and offer themselves up to a variety of interpretations. For instance, and, and most notably, do the rats even exist? No other person other than the narrator even seemed to hear them, but all the cats do. Are we witnessing some kind of deep psychological bond between the narrator and Exam Priory? The kind of antiquarian connection and morbidity that we witness in, say, The Fall of the House of Husher by Edgar Allan Poe, or even House of Leaves by Mark Danielewski. The most obvious interpretation of the story is also perhaps the most convincing, a very straightforward, even simplistic, psychological reading of the tale at the same time as the narrator and the other characters are descending into the deepest subterranean levels of the house, they are also descending into the deepest reaches of their own psyche, into the most monstrous corner of their own atavistic memories and their own hidden impulses. S.T. Joshi argues very convincingly, for instance, that this is exactly what happens with the narrator's final invective, where his language deteriorates from modern into Old English, then into the Latin of the Romans who built temples on the location where Exam Priory is built, then again into a Druidic language from even earlier times, and finally into a prehistoric guttural growl. The presence of the savage and the barbaric, of our most monstrous and cruel past, inside supposedly civilized and enlightened women and men, is a very important theme in horror and fantastical literature, and it's rarely dealt with in more impactful terms than Lovecraft. Another text that deals with it very well is The Island of Dr. Moreau by H.G. Wells, another personal favorite of mine. What I find remarkable about the narrator's final invective is that his son re-emerges precisely at the moment when his consciousness is deteriorating and he's confronted with the horror of the cannibalistic holocaust in his family's past and in the very house that had become his escape precisely from the trauma of his son's death. What he says is, why shouldn't rats eat a delapor as a delapor eats forbidden things? The war ate my boy, damn them all. Equating the massacres that occurred on the battlefields of Europe with the massacres that occurred in his own family history. And this comparison, I find, is where things start getting really scary. Because, in a way, the narrator is not wrong. That the Delapore used to systematically breed and herd human beings as cattle is unspeakable and horrifying. But isn't the way human beings were herded into armies and slaughtered on the battlefields and trenches equally horrifying? The scale of that massacre was much vaster. Even there, it was all done in the name of power, of very explicit interest, and hither ones too, that used the war to preserve their assets and make even more money out of it. 
The Delapore justified their practices through a veneer of black magic and ancient religion. In the same way as the nations that joined World War I justified their massacre via nationalism and xenophobia. The only difference, of course, is that the horror of the Delapor is fictional. It only exists in a spooky story. But the horror of World War I is real. It happened. There is, of course, another possible explanation why the narrator's son comes up precisely at this time where his psyche is deteriorating, which is pride, pure and simple. As the narrator says, he lived, he being chubby, lovely Captain Norris, but my boy died. Shall a Norris hold the lands of Adelapur? The narrator can't stand the idea that someone from an inferior class should survive and thrive while his own son died. Or again, consider this. While the narrator and the other characters are exploring the human pigpens underneath Exum Priory, the narrator remarks that one of the things Captain Norris finds most revolting and repulsive is just how familiar the surrounding environments look. It was too much to see familiar English implements in such a place and to read familiar English graffiti there. Why all this concern for such matters of class or race or culture? Now, H.P. Lovecraft was a racist. There's no doubts about it. Everybody knows that. It is an immense stain on his character and on his intellect, really. H.P. Lovecraft was other things too, some of them quite unpleasant, but his racism is the one thing that's truly unjustifiable in somebody who thought of themselves as an intellectual, a person of good reading, a person of science and uh, philosophy, somebody who strived to keep up with the philosophical, scientific developments of his time. Because he was so well read, because he was always interested in debating new ideas, Ideas with his friends and with other intellectuals. Throughout the course of his life, he managed to change his mind on many positions. And for instance, he moved from the belligerent conservatism of his youth to the socialism of his late life in the 1930s. Race was the one subject where he always refused not just to change his mind, but to open his mind and to read the many studies in philosophy, ethics, even science that were being published at the time precisely on the subject of race. The result of that is an immense pity for the Lovecraft fan who has to deal with the uncomfortableness of this and must deal with it, can't just look the other way and ignore it, but has to cope with the ugliness of these feelings. Not just in Lovecraft himself, who sure was a racist, but has been that eight years, more in his own work, which is marred and flowed because of these ugly feelings that emerge here and there, because of these ignorant sentences that you encounter in some of his stories. Flaffo's real name is just the tip of the iceberg, really. However, possibly because Lovecraft was at the end of the day, in some ways, an intelligent person. It's almost as if his fiction, in spite of his own beliefs, proves himself wrong and proves his own racism wrong. Lovecraft was an immense fanboy of England. Uh, he looked back to England as uh, the ancestral home of his family and his people. He was uh, such a fan of England that supposedly was anti-independence even when it came to the American Revolution. And yet England is precisely the setting of his most disturbed and impactful story. Throughout his fiction, except for some ugly early stories, the most rotten and vile horror is always associated with the English. Captain Obed Marsh, Joseph Kerwin, uh, Ephraim White, they're all wasps and they're all monsters. That's exactly what I was referring to when I was talking about that irony hidden in Flaffo's real name and possibly lost on Lovecraft himself, definitely on his character. The guy is racist enough to name his cat after a slur, and yet his own family ate people. Who's the real savage here? 
it's almost as if Lovecraft's vision and his poetics go beyond his own petty concerns for matters of ethnic or national pride, or his own fear of immigrants and fear of the unknown. By ascribing these great horrors to waspy English characters and settings, Lovecraft is talking about that theme I was referring to, that theme that is so central to his fiction, the presence in our past of unspeakable horrors and the great fear that these horrors might re-emerge. The fact that we are at the mercy not just of cosmic forces beyond our understanding, but of forces within our own past and our own DNA that shaped us and made us humans, made us this flowed, at times monstrous machines. For somebody like Lovecraft, who had both parents committed to a sanatorium, that must have been quite a powerful fear. These fears, these terrors of these forces that lie outside our control, are something we all share as people, as humans. What Lovecraft did was take these fears, take some of the darkest material available to people, and make it beautiful. Through his artistry, he created something that might be messed up and might keep us up all night because it's just so scary, but is also awe-inspiring and interesting and stimulating, and we can talk about it and discuss it and play with it. He took some of the most rotten material that the world has to offer and made it quite glorious. So these are some of the reasons why I think The Rats in the Walls is such a powerful text. As a straight-up spooky story, it's constructed brilliantly to hit the reader as hard as possible with the accumulation of its details and of its revelations. While I find it utterly terrifying in its broader and deeper implications for our conceptions of ourselves as selves and individuals and as humans, really. It remains one of the most impactful pieces of writing I have yet read. So what about that trip that I took? Back in 2019, I was reading I Am Providence, S.T. Josh's monumental biography of H.P. Lovecraft, a must-read text for all Lovecraft fans. It's ambitious, but worth it. And in uh, I Am Providence, Joshi discusses the possible source for Anchester, the fictional English village close to Exxon Priory in The Rats in the Walls. Joshi mentions Alchester in Oxfordshire as a potential potential source for Anchester, but he also remarks that Anchester in the Rats in the Walls was supposed to be the seat of the Third Augustan Legion back in Roman times, which Alchester wasn't. However, Alchester was the seat of the Second Augustan Legion. My theory, which I shared with Joshi, and it was really lovely in his reply, and he said, why not, it's not entirely impossible, not entirely implausible, is that Lovecraft actually had Alchester in Oxfordshire in mind as the setting of his story, and he either changed or misremembered the name and turned it into Anchester, and he either changed or misremembered the second Augustan Legion as the third. And this, by all means, is an absolute moot point, not just because it relates to a very minor and inconsequential matter, but because Anchester in the story plays absolutely no part whatsoever, the village is barely mentioned, no action takes place in it, it has no consequence on the story at all. So, of course, I embarked on a literary pilgrimage to this location that, in my heart, became the real world, real life equivalent of the setting of this short story that meant so much to me as a kid because it terrified me so deeply. Alchester is located somewhere between Oxford and Bicester. Google Maps, that most treacherous tool, told me that on my bike, it should take me around an hour and a half to get there. 
What I did on the day of my pilgrimage was I spent my morning volunteer at the Oxfam bookstore on Turtle Street and I finished my turn at 12.30. Now, I could have had lunch, but I thought, oh well, if it's only going to take an hour and a half, probably even a bit less, because I, I pedal fast, I could just go there, uh, be back home just after three and have a, a late lunch. So I jumped on my bike, I rode out of Oxford, past suburban streets, over speedways and ended up in the rolling golden fields of Oxfordshire. This was mid-August, by the way, and quite a warm day. Actually, thinking back to it, I think it was actually my birthday. The more I rode my bike toward Alchester and the more time passed, the more I realized by checking Google Maps quite frequently that I didn't seem to be getting close to the location, not quite as fast as I'd imagined. And I started getting worried. My water supply was, was getting low and Oxfordshire is infested with red kites, which are this, this type of hawk. Uh, they're all majestic and cute when they're flying high above the roofs, but when they're just sitting on a fence close to the isolated countryside road that you're riding your bike down, well, they can be quite scary. Uh, I must say, they're the kind of bird that, if they put their mind to it, they could probably eat somebody like me. A couple of hours later, not really close to Alchester, to my destination, two things happened. My phone battery died, probably because I'd been checking Google Maps so frequently, but really because I'm an idiot and didn't really plan the trip very well, and I ran out of water. I was quite sweaty by then, I was quite tired, but it made no sense to go back. And so, basing my na navigation on, well, the latest picture I had in my mind from Google Maps, I carried through, and I continued through the fields, through the villages, all the way to Alchester. I reached my destination, I looked around, and I headed back. Now, I'm probably exaggerating the danger I was in for the sake of the story. I was never too far away from a house or a village, and I wasn't that exhausted that I was actually on the verge of death. Especially if you come from someplace like, I don't know, the, the, the American Midwest or Australia, you probably think this is silly. You're like, oh man, I have to cross the prairies of Iowa every time I want a sandwich. But for somebody like me, I'm, I'm, I'm very much of an urban kid. I think that was the most stranded I've ever been, the most isolated and away from civilization I've ever found myself. The roads I was riding my bike around were quite deserted, there weren't that many cars around, and it was a really hot day, and I was sweaty and thirsty. I also had to hope very much that I remembered the way back, or I was never gonna come home at all. Bottom line, I got home not at 3 as I'd imagined, but I think uh, closer to 7, on the edge of fainting, and at least the memories will, will, will live forever, I imagine. Was Alchester everything I'd imagined it to be? Alchester looked exactly like any other field in Oxfordshire. There was absolutely nothing there. Supposedly, because it's the site of an old Roman fortress town, the archaeology department of Oxford University did some excavations and some works around the area, but they must have put everything back in exactly the way they found it, because it looked absolutely no difference than any other field I saw on that day or on any subsequent or previous day. Did I take a picture? I'm pretty sure I did, although I must have misplaced it or deleted it because I can't find it for the life of me. But again, it wouldn't be impressive. I'll show you a picture of a random field there. That's exactly what Anchester looked like. I sure wish I'd spent a little bit more time there and made the moment more meaningful. You know what I wish for? I wish that I'd sat down, uh, put my bike down for a second, and just sketched what I was seeing, and just sketched this significant place that has a certain, a certain spot in my heart now 
forever. What I wish is that I'd taken the excellent class by Katisha Karachiwala on landscape painting and sketching on Skillshare. An excellent class for beginners like me, introducing you to the fundamentals of how to capture the landscapes that matter to you, some uh, impactful, beautiful scene that you witness on your walks, on your explorations, and try and commit it to a piece of art and, and try and make it memorable. I really enjoyed Kadisha's class recently and it's just one of the countless wonderful and insightful and exciting classes offered on Skillshare. A wonderful online community of creators and creatives, experts in all sorts of fields from illustration to creative writing, design to personal financial skills, all sorts of topics are covered on Skillshare. It has a beautiful community feeling, it's a great place to learn at your own pace and to explore your own creativity and I highly recommend it. There is a link in the description box that will give the first thousand people to click on it a one month free trial of Skillshare so you guys can start exploring your creativity right away. I highly recommend you check the website out. Thank you so much for watching this video. As you probably uh, guessed, if you watch some other of my videos, I tried to do something slightly different with this one, some kind of video essay slash personal essay about a short story that's always meant a lot to me. Uh, even though I really hated it at one point for all this leap it made me lose and I'm really curious to hear what you thought of it. I'm really curious to hear what you think of the rats in the walls and everything I've mentioned in the video. Thank you so much for watching it. Thank you so much to my patrons for supporting the YouTube channel and have a great day. Bye everybody.